Let's um, turn now to God's Word, and I want to read from Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, and we'll commence reading at verse 1. Acts chapter 24, verse 1, if you follow with me. And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullius, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullius began to accuse him, saying, See that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. (coughs) We accepted always and in all places most noble Felix with all thankfulness, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray Thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple, whom we took, and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us, and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things, whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship, and they neither found me in the temple, disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the cities, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself, to have always a conscience void of offence toward God, and toward man. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee, and object if they had aught against me. Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me, while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice that I cried, standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I'm called in question by you this day. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I shall know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul, and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 23. (coughs) And we pray that God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text tonight is taken from Acts chapter 24 and the verse 15. And my subject this evening is the Christian's hope of the resurrection. Let's read verse 15 together. Acts 24 verse 15. 
and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Now our text this evening forms part of an address given by the Apostle Paul before the Roman (coughs) governor Felix. The Apostle Paul has been arrested, he's been imprisoned, he's now on trial for his life. He is being accused here by certain Jews and the religious leaders of his day of being a pestilent fellow, a, a, a mover of sedition a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And when Felix calls upon Paul, Paul makes his great defense before Felix from verse 10 and onwards. And he makes it abundantly clear in his opening statements that he's uh, not a leader of a rebellious sect, that he was not guilty of destroying the temple. That, that there's not a, a shred of proof that, that he was trying to cause a, a riot in the city of Jerusalem. And as he continues making his defense, he makes it abundantly clear why he is a true Christian. Here in very concise, plain terms, look at verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, remember he's speaking to Felix, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets, and of hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Now I want us to think tonight about the Christians' hope of the resurrection. And I want you to learn three or four things from this text of Scripture. First of all, I want you to think of the clarity of the resurrection. Here is the Apostle Paul, and in his defense before Felix, as he lays bare that these charges are false, he makes reference to the the doctrine of, of the resurrection, and he does so with great clarity and unusual plainness. And this reference, there is a resurrection of the dead, is not just a, a, a reference to the immortality of the soul, but also of the body. Think of the words, there shall be a resurrection of the dead. He's setting forth a great truth. It's no ifs or buts or maybes or could be or, or presumed to be the case, but It's definite, it's concrete, it's plain, it's real. There shall be a resurrection. So this is a very positive, concise, clear affirmation. What's he saying here? I have hope toward God. And what is that hope? That there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Now remember, Paul's in trial for his life. And I believe he's given a confession here. He's making a statement as to why he's a believer. The hope of the resurrection of the dead is at the center of the true Christian religion. Now, let me just point out a couple of things to you. Did you know that Abraham believed in the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead? Let let me prove that to you. Hebrews chapter 11 It says in the verse um, 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, that he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. For what reason? Look at verse 19. Accounting, Hebrews 11, 19, Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. You see, Abraham reckoned, he counted up in his mind, God is able to raise Isaac up from the dead. We could even think tonight, if you go back in your minds to Genesis 50, remember the Exodus story? Joseph, second in command to Pharaoh, 
over the whole of Egypt. Whenever he died, he made them promise that they would carry his bones up out of Egypt one day. That happened 430 years later. Now, now why carry his bones up? If they're of no value of worth or if there's not going to be a resurrection. We could think also of a contemporary of Abraham, uh, namely Job. And uh, Job, of course, believed (coughs) in the uh, doctrine of the resurrection. Remember he says there in uh, Job uh, chapter 19 uh, and verse 25. he, He says there, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body. Yet in my flesh I shall see God. Whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold and not another. Though my reins be consumed within me. Now now here's Job a contemporary of Abraham. And he believed in the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. And also so did the prophet Isaiah, because in Isaiah chapter 29, or 26, and in the verse 19, 26 and 19, Isaiah the prophet said, Thy dead shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead Isaiah the prophet believed in the resurrection of the dead and so did Daniel I remember in Daniel chapter 12 and it says in, in, in verse 2 and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth that's the dead shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt And we we could add into the mix the teaching of the Lord Jesus. If you uh, think of John chapter 5, for example, um, the Lord Jesus said there in John chapter 5, and in the um, verse um, 25, John 5 and 25, Verily, verily, that means truly, truly, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. For as the Father have life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So here's just a few references that help to affirm the clarity of the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. It was believed by Abraham, by Job, uh, by, by um, Moses. It was believed by uh, the prophet Isaiah, by the prophet Daniel, by the Lord Jesus. And you know, some very unusual events also testify of the doctrine of the resurrection of the people of God. Think of Enoch. How he was translated to heaven bodily without seeing death. Think of Elijah taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Then think of the contention over the body of Moses. When did that happen? I believe along with reformed commentators that it happened in connection with the transfiguration. You see, why dispute the body of Moses if it had no value? Why dispute the body of Moses if it's not going to be raised up again? Why dispute the body of Moses if it's not going to experience a resurrection? Think also of the parable of the wheat and tares in Luke 13. It affirms exactly the same truth, that there's going to be a resurrection of the body. So that's the first thing I want to think about, the clarity of the resurrection. And here's Paul, and he says there shall be a resurrection of the dead. Think also then of the certainty of the resurrection. Look at the words in the text. He says, and have hope toward God. Now what's his hope? Yes, you've guessed it, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead. And I want you to think this evening of the blessedness of that hope. See, every true born again believer 
washed in the blood of Christ, has got a very bright future ahead of them. These words, of course, are the words of the Apostle Paul as a man of God. At that time, his body, no doubt, was wrecked with pain. He was in shackles, a prisoner of Rome. He had been rejected by his fellow Jews and his kinsmen. He was the object of scorn and ridicule. And there's much reaction when he introduces the subject of the resurrection in these chapters, 24, 25, 26. We need to read them together. And we could say, well, by his fellow countrymen, this man was hung out to dry. He knew heaviness at heart. He knew bitter disappointment. This man knew discouragement. Physically, the man was a midget. No, no, no bigger than a, 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 a grasshopper in that sense. A small little man, they reckon. Four foot six, maybe five foot. Bald headed, bad eyesight. And what does he say before Felix? Now, now take all this on board. A prisoner. He's in pain. He, he's been rejected by his fellow countrymen. He, he has got all this in his mind and in his heart. He's these obstacles physically. And what does he say? Therefore... And have hope toward God. Remember he's on trial for his life. He's facing death. And he comes to this conviction. He's got this conclusion. Here's the real medicine for his soul. And what is it? I've got a bright future. I've got a sure and certain hope. We live tonight in a world of suffering and great pain, a world of anguish and tears, a world of death and sorrow. And what's the medicine for the soul for individuals in that category? The only answer is to be able to say with truth, I have hope toward God. You see, his hope was real. And glory to God, it was a regal hope because he, 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 he's a man who lived a life of pain and sorrow and grief. He was acquainted with the man of sorrows. Doesn't history testify of many great men that were used by God living a life of pain and sorrow and grief? Days when they had darkness in their soul. Days when they faced death. Days of dearth in their fellow countrymen. I, I think of some, John Calvin in Geneva, Martin Luther, his body was often wrecked with pain, he found it hard as he testified to get out of bed in the morning, Charles Haddon Spurgeon uh, grappled with gout for many, many years, and here's Paul, and he too knows bodily pain, he knows one day he's going to die. One day he's going to stand face to face before God. One day he's going to go into God's eternity. One day there'll be the judgment. And he knows that after death, what has he got? He's got the hope of resurrection. You see, the day of our death, our soul leaves the body and enters into the presence of the Lord. And of course our bodies... They're going to be placed into the ground. But let me just tell you something. When the body's placed into the ground, that's only the intermediate state of the body. That's not the end of the body. That's not the final state of the body. And when Paul says, I have hope toward God, he wasn't just thinking of the resurrection of his soul. He, he was thinking that there's even a great future for his body. Because he's not going to remain a, a disembodied soul forever. One day his soul and body will be reunited and he'll be forever with the Lord. When his soul enters heaven, that's not his final hope. His final hope is the resurrection of the body. Remember what he went on to say writing to the church of the Philippines. And he was trying to encourage them as best he could. And of course, there, there was many reasons for God's people uh, in that day to be discouraged. And he says there in Philippians 3, verse 21, For our conversation is in heaven. The word conversation means manner of living. From whence also we look for the Saviour. He's coming back again. The Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at Philippians 3, 21. 
who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. This body in which we lived, this body that's been a vehicle for sin, and corruption and wickedness. This body that's been subject to, to much humiliation. I was thinking about the elderly. Having visited quite a number of nursing homes recently. And I was thinking about those whose health and strength is gone. Who have lost the vigour and the vitality of youth. That their body's full of aches and pains. Some suffer from Alzheimer's. Some have got dementia. Some couldn't lift a spoon to feed themselves. They couldn't hold a cup. And yet before that, they were great men and women of God. And they loved the Saviour. And I thought to myself, how quickly the body can bring about Humbling. Humbling for our soul. Mortally and physically all of us are going downhill. Daily our bodies dying and beginning to shut down. But here's a great comfort. Here's a truth. That Jesus Christ when he comes back is going to change our foul body. And give us a new body and transform it so that it's like his glorious body. Yes, our bodies are vehicles of sin. Yes, they're full of weakness, aches and pains. Yes, they, they can know wantonness. But one day Jesus Christ is going to transform our, our bodies. Remember what the Apostle John was able to write to the church there in 1 John chapter 3. And in the verse 2 he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Not only with him, but like him. He's going to raise our bodies just an ordinary body. You'll recognise the Lord Jesus Christ in his body. You'll know him by the wounds in his hands. You'll recognise your loved ones that have died in Christ. It'll be raised an ordinary body. Yes, the properties will be different. It'll be perfectly conformed to Christ. But it'll still be that ordinary body that was sown into the earth. And I just want to ask, have you the blessedness of this hope in your soul? We all know that one day we'll die. We know that death is a very unpleasant thought. But Paul was a man. He didn't fear death. He wasn't even thinking about facing the judgment. He wasn't thinking about the day when his ministry be over into God's eternity. What could he say? Hope toward God. Think of the basis of this hope. You see, hope has to stand on a sure foundation. And of course, this hope is rooted in our union with Jesus Christ. See, our union with Christ is the basis for our hope that one day our bodies will rise. Just as the body of Jesus rose again from the dead... All who are in Christ, their body also will be raised from the dead. When Paul says, I have hope toward God, his hope was in God. It was upon God. It was toward God, not in himself, not in the church, not in, not in other good men, neither in Christian, neither Jew nor Gentile. It was certainly a hope that was not whistling in the dark. It was grounded on God himself. And have hope toward God. And let's remember this God that he was talking about. is not the God of the dead. But of the living. Remember he says I'm the God of Isaac. And of Abraham and of Jacob. Isaac and Abraham and Jacob. They're, they're still alive. And, and their resurrection is guaranteed. Because of their union with Jesus Christ. I was thinking about this a couple of days ago. The Lord Jesus just didn't come to redeem our souls. He came to redeem our bodies. It's not a tremendous comfort. In raising Christ bodily from the dead, God is also going to raise up 
every believer in Christ. And the Old Testament foretold his death. He had to die. He had to rise again. The New Testament teaches us he did die and he did rise again. You see, if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, we have no hope. We have no hope of salvation, no hope of forgiveness of sins, no hope of having peace with God, no no hope of having access to the Lord in prayer, no hope of a resurrection, no, no hope of ever being in heaven. The only hope for the Christian. Why, it's a blessed truth. The basis is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Doesn't the Bible say in Adam all die? That is die spiritually, but also die physically. Death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. But in Christ shall all be made alive. Alive spiritually to God, but alive physically. (coughs) Here's not only the clarity of the resurrection, but here's the certainty of the resurrection. It's a blessed thing. And it's basis is rooted in what Jesus Christ did. Notice also here very quickly the comfort of the resurrection. And I refer back to this word hope. It's sure and certain. If you turn tonight in your Bible there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and let's just look at verse 13. This is often read at funerals. Maybe it's the only time it's read. But I want you to think of the comfort of the resurrection. He says in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Notice the reference to hope here. You see, the Apostle Paul was dealing in Thessalonica with troubled saints. And they were very worried about their loved ones that had died. They've given up the ghost. Their soul is with Christ in heaven. Their bodies have been put into the grave. And they're worried and troubled. Well, what about their bodies, Paul? And Paul says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You see, it's okay to cry, your loved ones taken from us. It's okay to be in sorrow. But, but don't allow that sorrow to, to, to stop you from overcoming. Don't let the sorrow control you. Don't, don't sorrow exorbitantly, as if the lights have went out completely and you've lost out with God and you can't overcome. That, that type of deep grief belongs to the unbeliever because they have no hope. But we have hope. And what is our hope? Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. This is to do with the second coming. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. See, Jesus is coming again. And we link it up with Philippians 3.21. When he comes, he's going to change our vile bodies. But before he changes our vile bodies, if we're alive in the earth when he comes, and some will be, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, we don't know when he's coming. There's no point in setting dates. I I reject any date setting or date setters. But we know this, that one day he's coming. And when that happens, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That is, their soul will be reunited with their body. Their body's going to come together. It doesn't matter if it's crumbled into dust. doesn't matter if it's blown to the four corners of the wind. doesn't matter if it's a pile of ashes in a casket that's long since decayed. The people of God who have died in Christ, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, that their bodies are sown in the earth and it's going to be raised in the newness of life. See, what made Paul tick? What kept Paul going, facing pain and bodily aches and everything else? It was the doctrine of the resurrection. 
Look at a wee verse that has really struck me. Over there in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. And let's look at it together. You, you think of this the next time you're having it hard and it's difficult and you want to quit. And you think, well, where's my comfort for my soul? Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 32. For this is what made Paul tick. He says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me? And note the words, If the dead rise not, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now what's he saying? He's saying if I have experienced all that I've experienced in life for the cause of Christ and in the name of the Lord Jesus. I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. He he was thinking of those who were opposed to him, those who were persecuting him. And there's no resurrection. What he's telling us here, I'm a fool, I'm a madman. Let, let, Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. He says, but I have fought wild beasts in Ephesus. I have faced every devil in Impa hell. I have experienced trials and troubles. The the, the man has done their worst to me. Terrible things. And what's the worst they could do? If they kill me, I die and go to heaven. See, See, that was his hope. And that's what made him tick. And that's what kept him going. Maybe today you're in aches of pains. I want you to think of that day when you'll be painless and free. Maybe today here you fear and you have tears. I want you to think of a day when your tears will be dried up and you'll have no more fear. Today you you face the spiritual night and the darkness is in your soul. But one day in heaven there'll be no night there. And Today you've got many worries and pressures and problems. But over there on the other side our worries, our fears, our problems are gone. See Paul had got a living vital hope and that's what gave him strength that's what put backbone into him he could face anything because this hope had gripped and comforted his soul every opposition of the world every type and form of persecution he was consumed and gripped by this thought I have got a hope toward God that there shall be a resurrection of the body are you getting the sense of the message in this Easter Sunday The clarity of it's there in the scriptures. I've already tried to prove that in the few references. The certainty is it's a blessed hope and it's based in union with Christ and it was a comfort and a strength to Paul's soul. Now one final thing and I'm just going to touch on this. I'm going to preach this as a separate subject. His confession of the resurrection. (laughs) Look at our text again. What, what, What does it say? That there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. The the reference to the just is every saved person, every person who's born again and washed in the precious blood of Christ. Not only is their soul saved, but Jesus died to save and redeem their body. And also there's a resurrection of the unjust. Here's Paul. And he's thinking not only of the immortality of the soul, but he's thinking of the immortality of the body. And even the unjust, the ungodly, the man who rejects Christ. Do you know his body's going to be raised up as well at the great white throne judgment? And he will give an account to God of things done in the body. And if his name's not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the Bible tells us he'll be cast into the lake of fire. Isn't that what we read there in Revelation chapter 20? Let let me just read the passage or draw attention to the passage and then we'll close. Here's his confession of the resurrection. He says in John or or Revelation 20, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. See, this is a bodily resurrection. This is the unjust. This is the great white throne. And the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. That's the the disembodied souls. 
And they were judged, every man according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We believe in the eternal bliss of the saint. We also believe in the eternal banishment and punishment of those who die in their sins. Jesus said three times, John chapter 8, Verse 21 to 24. If you die in your sins, where I am, there you cannot be. And the resurrection that you face is as sure and certain, but it's a resurrection to damnation and eternal punishment, body and soul, forever and ever. There's his confession of the resurrection. Now let me just ask in closing, In which category are you tonight? Are you looking forward to the resurrection of the just? Because you're in Christ, you're saved. Or do you have to admit, you know, I'm not saved tonight. And if I was to die, I'd have a resurrection. I'd be among the unjust. It doesn't have to be like that. You could come to Christ tonight. You can just, where you're sitting, you can call upon the Lord. (coughs) Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You go home rejoicing, having the knowledge of Christ as Lord and Saviour. Think of the Christian's great hope of the resurrection. It's clear in the Bible. It's certain. It's a blessing. It's got a basis. And it's a comfort. Here's the confession. In which category will you be found in that day? We would urge you if you're not saved come to Christ.